Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to class. Hope all of you had a good uh, weekend, a good, restful, refreshing uh, weekend. Onina Santosh is joining us uh, okay, online. Welcome to all our online students and also to our e-learning students. I saw uh, Vimal this morning. Vimal is also joining us uh, online. Okay. okay, let's begin our um, study on the kingdom of God. And before we begin, uh, let's pray. Can one of the online students lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can unmute your mics and lead us in prayer? Online students? Yeah. Hi, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Chira is praying. Okay, one minute. Okay. Can I start, ma'am? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, my Father God. And we thank you, Jesus, for all teachers, ma'am. And Lord, as we're going to begin our class, my Father God, help us to understand more of your word, my Father God, and help us to know you more to this class, my Father God. Thank you, Daddy, for this new day and all the things in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chira. Uh, so uh, last week, last Monday, we began looking at, what were we studying? Uh, yes. Before we looked at the church and the kingdom, what did we study? The king and the kingdom. Uh, we saw that God is the king of his uh, kingdom. And, uh, and as king, what should be our... Uh, uh, how do we relate to him? As a king, how do we relate to him? We looked at two ways. Okay, uh, God looks at us as an inheritance. Um, you need to use the mic, okay? Uh, but what should be our, uh, you know, how do we relate to God as king? We relate to him as sons and daughters. What should be our attitude towards the king? We looked at two different aspects in how our attitude should be. One is worship, okay, how we need to worship this king. And the second one is prayer, right? So uh, remember, we spoke about these two attributes, Psalms chapter 44, verse 4. We said, uh, uh, the psalmist says, God, you are my king and command victories or decree victories over Israel and Jacob. So we learned, you know, these are the two ways that we can relate. One is uh, through worship and the other is through prayer. We also looked at Isaiah chapter 9, okay, uh, where we saw the names of this king, his attributes and how we can relate to his attributes uh, uh, in our own lives. And then we looked at how God introduced, how the king of this kingdom came and introduced his um, kingdom. Um, and we saw the threefold approach of how Jesus or how this king introduced the kingdom. So what is the threefold approach that Jesus used? Yes, preach, teach, and kingdom of God, he taught about the kingdom of God, and he demonstrated it through science, miracles, and um, wonders. And so we looked at briefly some of his preachings and teachings on the kingdom of God. We look at more even as we go through this, um, uh, this course. And then we also saw how he demonstrated the power of the kingdom. Okay, And then we moved on to chapter 3, where we looked at the church and the kingdom. So what aspect of um, the church and the kingdom that we looked at in Matthew chapter 16 verses uh, 18 and 19? 
what has he uh, got what has the king of the kingdom given to us as his uh, heirs heirs of god we are heirs of god and co-heirs of jesus christ he has given us the keys and what does keys uh, yes represent authority it represents authority it represents power and what else You'll have to use your mic, others. The online students won't be able to hear you. Okay. He's also given us the authority. He's given us the control. Okay. Protection. And what is uh, what are we supposed to do as heirs? Like uh, we looked at. Uh gates are constant that uh, as a church we have to advance to the gates and uh, conquer them okay the gates are stationary uh, what does gates uh, represent here or signify power and protection yeah. of what power control and protection okay so that is in in the in the in the physical natural sense but here in the in the spiritual sense what does gate signify or represent Online students, you all can also uh, answer. What does gates signify? Yeah, gates represent uh, authority, uh, you know, the places of control. This, and it's also a place of power because, you know, in olden times, um, the head of the whole town or city sat at the gates and, you know, gave judgment. It also had, uh, you know, a place of access, a control who can go in and who can come out. But what does gate represent in the spiritual sense? The church has to advance the gates. Okay, gates represent power and dominion. Power and dominion, yes, but whose power and dominion? Here it says, the, look at Matthew chapter 16, verses. Yes, uh, Nina Santos says, hell. Okay, gates represent hell. Gates represent power and dominion. Whose power and dominion? The church has to advance the gates. Yeah, the keys of authority is given to the church. The, the church, yes, the church has to advance against the gates. And who is the gates represent enemy? Okay, it's a power of darkness, Satan and his forces. Okay, so gates basically here in the physical talks about, yes, you know, uh, uh, access, control. Also, it's a place of authority where the, the elders of the city or the town or village sat and passed their judgment. Also had control of access who would come and go, uh, go in and go out. But here when we're talking about in the spiritual sense, gates represents power and dominion of the evil one. Okay, so we advance, the church advances against the power and the authority of the enemy okay so that is what we were looking at and what else um, the church has to do from matthew chapter 16 verses 18 and 19 the church has to advance against the gates okay because why will it not prevail against us the gates why will the gates of hell not prevail against us have the keys we have the keys we have the authority and we already have the victory right victory is already given to us jesus is the captain of our salvation hebrews okay and he shares his victory with uh, us okay um but what else should the uh, church do here in in yes this authority to bind things uh, which are which are in heaven and release things to bind things okay which is which bound, bound in heaven in and and release things okay so we got this authority as a church yes so we uh, we have not only given the keys of the kingdom yes uh, thank you uh, anand right anand and jackin uh, we have the authority to bind the powers and the authority of the evil one in prayer 
uh, we also bind on earth what is bound in heaven we lose on earth what is loosed in heaven so the church basically brings heaven to earth okay just give me a minute So the church is part of God's kingdom here on earth today. And um, the church comprises of whom? Yes, and who are we? We are the body of Christ. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We have been given, we have been vested with the authority to overthrow what the devil is doing and to usher in here on earth uh, what is in heaven. Okay, now to understand this, let's go back to Genesis chapter 4, um, uh, verse 1. Okay, or we can just look at um, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. Sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. Can somebody read that, please? Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. Okay, so we see that when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible teaches us that Adam and Eve were both created and made. Okay? They were both created and made we read here in this passage God said let us make man in our image and then he says he also created man so man is very unique because he is both created and made a body was made God took mud okay and he made us out of uh, the dust of the earth and his spirit, God created man's spirit. And when he breathed into us, man became a, a living being, okay? A, a life-giving being or a living being, okay? So Adam was an, actually, if you look, Adam was an offspring of God, okay? He was made by God, but he was also created in the sense, you know, God breathed into man. God, the Holy Spirit, created in the sense the breath of God, the spirit of God, you know, was created in us. And so Adam was an, is an offspring of God. His origin is from God. Okay. So this is so amazing. Uh, and imagine this God who is king, this omnipotent ruler of this universe, he created Adam and Eve and then he gives them a, what does he give them? He gives them dominion. He issues them a decree, right? He says, let them have dominion. And God says, let them have dominion. And so who is this God who's saying, let them have dominion? We saw this God is the king of his kingdom. He's an omnipotent ruler. He's all powerful. He's omniscient, omnipresent. Um, He's eternal. He's sovereign. And this God is issuing a decree saying, let Adam and Eve have dominion on the earth. And this is no small thing because God is speaking into mankind's life. He's speaking into Adam and Eve's life. He's speaking into your uh, and my life. And he's saying, hey, I've designed you for dominion. Okay? So each of you are designed for dominion. What is the meaning of your design for dominion? To take control, to rule, to reign, to have authority, to have power. So where do we have dominion? Where do we have dominion? 
on the earth. Yes, we have dominion on the earth. That meaning that God is saying whatever happens or whatever transpires here on this planet earth is under our jurisdiction. That means it's under our authority. It's under our dominion. So the authority of the whole of the earth has been given to us. Who? Yes, it's been given to make it more personal, right? To us. Make it even more personal to you and me. Yes, it's very important for us to know that we have the authority. We have the uh, dominion. Okay. So he says, let them have dominion. And these are no small words that God was speaking. We can't take it lightly. Okay. Because he was, he was transferring or he was delegating his rule, his lordship, his authority, his dominion to mankind. Just imagine this great, powerful, awesome king, mighty. We can't even see him. We can't even go near him. You know, this great king is actually, you know, delegating or transferring his authority, lordship, his power, his rule, his dominion to, into mankind. So man's authority is uh, actually coming from which realm? The spiritual realm. Yes, it's coming from the spiritual realm. Why? God is a spirit being, yes. We are his offspring and he's extending his rule, his reign through man and woman here on earth. Okay. So he's given us the dominion, he's given us the authority and he's saying through them, my rule, my reign, my kingdom, my government will be extended here on the earth. Okay. So we looked last week at who this great king is. He's a wonderful counselor. Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, the ruler of peace. And he is wanting to express himself here on the earth, but he's expressing himself through whom? Through you and me. Okay. So in putting dominion on the earth, basically God was saying, you know, my kingdom will be extended here on earth through mankind, which means all that I am, all of my fullness, all of my glory, all of my attributes, all of my nature uh, that is invisible will now become visible. How? Through us. Yes. You know, through us. So just imagine the, uh, the, how God looks at each one of us. Right? He doesn't look at us, oh, these are weaklings, these are, uh, you know, prone to sin, prone to temptation. I don't think. But look at how big God is thinking about us, how great his thoughts are. That's why the psalmist in 139 says, how precious are your thoughts towards us? How vast, how, you know, immeasurable God's thoughts is uh, towards us. And here he's looking at each one of us as, hey, each one of you are kings and queens. You know, you are not servant men, uh, um, matter. You are not made as servants, as slaves, but you are kings. You're co-heirs with God. Can you imagine that? I mean, I I'm just repeating this because I want us to know, including me, our identity, who we are so that we can... How can we usher in God's kingdom? God is not saying, hey, you are my children. So, you know, how, how parents treat children, right? Even when we've grown up, even if we are married, even if we have our children, our parents will tell, still tell us what to do and what not to do. Yes, God is a father. He, he guides us. He leads us. But he looks at us as his co heirs right? And he's delegating and he's transferring his authority to each um, one of us. And he's saying, hey, I'm not only just giving you authority and dominion, but all of who I am, my glory, my fullness, my nature, my attributes, my character, I want you to manifest that here on earth. And I think we need to take hold of, you know, what God is taking hold of us. We need to take hold of what God is thinking of us. We need to take hold of what God has planned and prepared for us even before the foundations of the earth. Okay. So God's authority from the invisible realm is being released here into the visible. His authority came from the spiritual and God is spirit and it came into the natural realm. And how did it come through you and 
me. So God is looking at each one of us. You know, our whole I, um, um, uh, 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 work here on earth is not, hey, I've received salvation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, amen. I'm going to heaven. I have a place in heaven. I have a big mansion in heaven. So I don't have to worry about anything here. But no, it's our responsibility to, to extend God's kingdom here on earth and usher in others into his uh, kingdom okay in the light of that i just like to um you know say that you know um um you were you were asking me i think last week or week before last you know about uh, the justice and the righteousness of god so how can we say god is just and right and he punishes sin and at the same time how can we say he's loving gracious compassionate and merciful so if you look at romans chapter 2 verse 4 it says you know or do you despise the riches of his goodness his forbearance long suffering not knowing that the goodness of god leads to repentance romans chapter 2 verse Okay, uh, just this is like a side note. Um, uh, so since the students here, the uh, the in person students ask, how can you know um, we weigh in a balance? God's righteousness is just. He's a just God. When he sees sin, he punishes sin. At the same time, he's loving, gracious, compassionate, and um, forgiving. So if you look at Romans chapter two, and I'm bringing, I'm going to connect that to what we are studying here about the church and the kingdom. If you look at Romans chapter two, verse four, he says, "Don't despise the goodness, the patience, and the long suffering of God, because the goodness of God is going to lead to what repentance." The so think about it: the goodness of God is going to lead to repentance yes god is a just god his justice demands that just judgment for all sin but how does god at the same time deal with sinful man paul says that the goodness of god leads people to repentance so when we sin god judges our sin but really god is trying to draw people to himself through his goodness mercy forbearance and long suffering okay Sorry? God yes. So it's like what will be the consequence now for us? We will face the consequence, but at the same time, we'll, we, we don't focus on the consequence, but we're focusing more on, you know, that even if, you know, uh, 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 the, the word of God says a father, you know, corrects, rebukes or punishes uh, his son. Why? Because he loves. So how much more the heavenly father when he loves us so now if an earthly father punishes this uh, that uh, his son or daughter you know uh, he's not going to be rude to that extent where he's going to kill or murder or send the child away or the the, uh, the son or daughter away from home the punishment is why so that the child can learn can correct their ways Yes, will not repeat it, would come in the right ways and follow in ways of righteousness and holiness. So even the consequences for us, since God is, is looking at it as a, a way that will bring about his goodness, mercy, forbearance and long suffering so that, you know, his people come back to uh, him. So in that same light, you know, um, if you look at Paul in, in, in Corinthians and he also in Timothy, he says, you know, if somebody is sinning, throw them out of the church, send them out of the fellowship. And then in, in Corinthians, he says, you know, give them up to Satan. Now we can say, how can Paul it, be so rude? You know, how can he say, give them up to Satan, send them out of the fellowship, don't have anything to do with uh, these people who are, you know, uh, involved in sexual immorality. He's saying, yes, give them, teach them, you know, speak to them. If they still don't, then send them out. Why does Paul say that? Because he's saying, he continues to say that when they go out and they step out, you know, they're away from the protection, the spiritual covering, the spiritual protection of God. And what happens when we're outside God's spiritual covering and protection? The enemy is all out to steal, kill, and destroy. And then what happens when we go through uh, problems and difficulties? We come back to God. We run back to God. Say, God, I've sinned. I've done this. I'm receiving uh, curses, this, that. We can do anything. Please forgive me. Take me back as a child. Like the prodigal son. He knew where his place of worth and where he would get food to eat. And at least 
a place to stay, some kind of mercy he would receive. So he comes back. So he's saying, um, so here in Romans chapter 4, when Paul is writing, he's saying, hey, you know, yes, God is just, he is righteous, but he's also patient, long-suffering, and good and merciful in his his consequences his punishment is going to bring back people to him so he's saying when you are um preaching so that is why you need to be patient with people okay coming back to the church in the kingdom of god so everybody in this room including me is not perfect right you might not like something i've done something i've said you might be upset with me or whatever uh, we might not get along with each other, but what does the kingdom of God tell us? Thinking and thinking, next chapter. Now we need to love our enemies, okay? And do good to those who do harm or evil uh, to us. So he's saying, uh, basically in Romans chapter 2, he's saying, don't judge sin. You're no one to judge because the point you judge, you are also sinning. What you need to do is you need to be patient with people show them the mercy the goodness and the forbearance of uh, jesus christ okay no no that does not mean now coming to that that does not mean paul is saying here you shouldn't condone sin you should not overlook sin you should not correct sin you should not address sin no that is not what he's saying he's already saying you know he's uh, he's talking to the jews here and romans saying hey in this chapter, I'm not explaining the whole chapter of Romans chapter 2, but he's saying, hey, you Jews, you think you have the law, but at the same time, the very law that you think you're very proud of, you're breaking it. And when you are breaking it, how dare you judge somebody else? How dare you judge the Gentiles? Okay. So coming back to the, the church and the kingdom of God, you know, God has given us the authority. He's given us the power and we are here to represent represent him that is what i'm trying to say we are here to represent his goodness his mercy his compassion his forbearance his love why so that people can come back to him so that people can repent okay so that people can receive salvation salvation yes is the power of god the word that goes out but also it is why do why would people choose jesus compared to other gods because he's basically very forgiving, gracious, merciful, compassionate, kind, loving. He's a father. He's not just some power. He's not just some energy. We can't, we, we can't relate with power and energy, right? Can't say, okay, I, I can't say I'm going to relate with this electricity, power and energy. It, makes, it basically makes no sense to us. But God is not an power. He's not an energy. He is a person. He relates to us as a person okay and when he relates to us as a person he relates to us with all of his nature and his attributes and that is what he's saying i want you as the church as the saints as the people in my kingdom who are vested with authority now don't use the authority to be bosses don't use the authority to uh, you know uh, to command uh, to bring down but be like me just even as i'm righteous and just i'm also gracious merciful forbearing and um loving okay so the key here is uh you know we have the authority Our authority comes from god but what is the key the key here is obedience okay so as long as adam and eve walked in obedience they walked in they walked in as long as they walked in obedience they walked in authority yes so as long as you and i walk in obedience we will walk in authority now you might be wondering hey this person when they that person prays such authority such power god hears healing happens deliverance happen but when i'm praying absolutely no authority the devil doesn't seem to be scared of me you know why because we are not obedient to god Okay, obedience is the key here. Okay, now when Adam and Eve um, disobeyed, they lost their authority. They became slaves, right? But God had created them to have dominion, even dominion over Satan, right? See, he says, you know, um, uh, he says that, you know, uh, subdue. What is the meaning of subdue? God doesn't want you to subdue. Who do you subdue? You subdue whom? You subdue the enemy, 
right when you go for war you subdue the enemy it's it's a it's a word that is used for warfare subdue so when it says god says subdue means put under keep press keep down you know keep oppress yeah keep under your control your authority so subdue here is basically saying hey there is an enemy you need to subdue him and i've given you authority because i've won over the uh, enemy of crush satan okay so obedience to god is absolutely vital to walk in a uh, dominion that he's vested in you and me so it's simple as long as adam and eve were able to have um, dominion as long as they obeyed god okay the day they disobeyed god everything went out of control they became slaves so how important is obedience and how important is obedience to god for god obedience is absolutely important okay no partial obedience there's no partial obedience for god like king saul says you know when samuel comes and says you know god told you to put kill every animal you know when you were when to fight the king of this son why did you bring the king you know back here why do you bring the animals so he said no we brought these animals just to sacrifice to god okay so he says because you have disobeyed but samuel says hey i've done what god asked me to do so sometimes we think hey we did what god asked us to do why is god punishing me partial obedience is disobedience delayed obedience is still disobedience okay so it's absolutely important for us to walk in the obedience of god and when we do that we'll be able to flow in authority and uh, um, and uh, you know we will be able to overcome our enemy so our authority is spiritual it comes from the spiritual realm it flows into the natural realm so what really connects us to the spiritual realm is where our authority comes from okay and um, and we need to walk in authority we need to walk in obedience uh, to god then only we can resist the devil okay so we see that when adam sinned he lost his authority satan took over but we see the king of the kingdom comes back jesus christ he came he redeemed us he brought us back and then he says i'm giving you the keys of the kingdom of authority of heaven now the authority is vested in the redeemed saints of god now i like to just look at these demonic spirits like cockroaches and rats that infest our house okay some of you are <laughs> you know just thinking as an example i like i like to look at demonic spirits as these cockroaches and these rats okay that come and creep into our homes and you know as long as you love them what will happen they'll stay they will multiply they'll be all over okay and 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 then soon it will become like the plague that you know of, of frogs that was all over the egyptians but what do you do yeah you take hit <laughs> you take hit or you take the 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 rat uh, you know rat traps or you you put uh, you know uh, various nowadays they have so many solutions for cockroach everything and if you see it running uh, somewhere in your house you run behind it with your chappals and your slippers and the broom and you kill it okay so when you use your authority when you decide to use your authority that's when you're able to clean up your houses of cockroaches and rats but as long as you tolerate them you're happy with them they're happy to invest your uh, infest your not invest yeah. inf <laughs> infest your home okay it's the same this example is the same with demonic spirits okay god has given us dominion the king of the uh, universe has released his authority into your lives the demon has no right to infest your house and your life and any area of your life okay as long as you welcome them tolerate them you are happy with them you're living with them you know you know how what happens in the end but the day you arise and say hey enough is enough 
Satan has done enough with my life. You know, you suddenly realize, hey, I learned today I've got the keys of authority. So I have to wake up. I have to clean up my life. I have to clean up the areas of my life. And when you use your authority that you derive from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you say, devil, time you leave. Enough is enough. Stop. You have no authority, no place. You know, and you bind and you release and you speak God's promises over your uh, life. Okay, so we need to exercise, exercise God-given authority in in our world, in our sphere of influence, in your sphere of activity, in bringing the kingdom of God into every area, every sphere, every place that God has blessed you with, and your even your own faculties, your mind, your emotions, your will, every area of your um, life. And you need to know something, that the king of glory is backing you up. Okay, the king of glory is backing you up. Amen? Okay, we see that in the final 40 days of uh, Jesus on the earth, you know, before he was able, he ascended back to the Father in heaven, uh, he, he, uh, Jesus knew that he had only 40 days left with his disciples. And when you know that your time is very short on earth, what would you do? If you knew your time on earth is very short, what would you do? You'll accomplish everything that you have. Do <laughs> Sean is saying that he will do everything that he wants. So, Sean, I need to see your lists. Okay. I think I need to get Sean's list and I need to help him out. Okay. So, yeah, we would uh, we would do things that are have to be done, that are important, right? That are Im that is very, very important. Um you know, my uncle passed away during COVID, my dad's oldest brother. But uh, before he passed away, he knows his time has come. He was almost 80 plus. You know, he has, the way he has, you know, organized everything, papers, written down, you know, every file has a list of what is there and what is in, you know, in it. And he's made sure that everything is up to date and he's explained everything to his older daughter. So, you know, uh, when his when he passed away and the daughters went to the to look for, you know, some important documents, every file was so neat with details, with the list of what is in each file. So you don't have to search paper after paper in a big heap. You just look at the file, it's done, everything. And he said, so meticulously done, so neatly done, we didn't have to have any problems. And everything was up to date. So he's done what was very, very important with the family, with his daughters, in the church, in the kingdom of God. And see how the foreplanning that he um, right. Okay. So, you know, when Jesus was here and he, uh, you know, after he resurrected, he came back 40 days, you know, he knew that he had to do the things that were topmost priority and important. And what was the important things he, he did look at Acts chapter one, verse three. Can, can some, he thought about the kingdom of God. Acts chapter one, verse three can, our, um, Online students very quiet, so can we have one of our online students read, please? Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Online students, you are there? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Chira is reading. Yeah. Acts 1, 3. To whom he also present himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Amen. So, what was uh, Jesus doing and teaching and preaching them? Yes, the kingdom of God, so important. See, so the kingdom of God is so important. We'll see how, as a church, we've kind of forgotten about the kingdom of God. We moved away from the whole thing. So we see that, you know, in those 40 days, Jesus continued to teach about the kingdom of God. Okay, 
Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, talking about the kingdom. All through he's talking the parables is all about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Even after he resurrected and before his ascension, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Okay, So Jesus began his ministry by saying the kingdom of God is here or the kingdom of heaven is here. Throughout his ministry, he preached and taught and he demonstrated the kingdom. And even in the 40 days, he continued to emphasize on the kingdom of God. And this was so caught by his disciples. The disciples knew that for Jesus, what was the main topic of his sermons? Kingdom of God. Okay. So we see that they also, after Jesus ascended uh, back to the Father, went back to the Father, we also see that the early church also continued to speak and um, uh, teach and demonstrate about the kingdom of God. And one example is Philip. Who is Philip? Anyone knows who is Philip? He is a disciple. Philip is actually one of the, like Stephen was one of those who was like, um, you know, a, a steward just waiting upon uh, people, you know, uh, giving food, supplying food, getting ration, taking care of the widows and the orphans in the church, feeding them. But we see that, you know, um, um, uh, Philip, you know, he, when the persecution arose, he went to Samaria, okay, and he went and preached and he taught and also went about doing mighty signs, miracles and wonders. We read that in um, in Acts chapter 8 verse uh, 12. So can one of you please read Acts chapter 8 verse 12. Can you please take the mic, uh, Sean? Uh, do you mean that uh, Philip was a deacon? Yes, Philip was a deacon, yes, yes. Okay, can one of you please read Acts chapter 8, verse 12, please? Any one of our online students likes to read? Jackin, you like to read Acts 8, ch uh, chapter 8, verse 12? Yes, Pastor. Yes. Acts 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Amen. So we see here that... You know, um, what did Philip preach in Samaria? The things concerning the kingdom of God. And he also preached the name of Jesus Christ. And what happened? Both men and women accepted Jesus Christ. That means they were, they received salvation and they were baptized. Okay. Let's look at a couple more verses uh, so some of the online students and in-person students can also get ready to read. We look at Paul and Barnabas. Paul was a great apostle. Barnabas also went along with uh, Paul in the first missionary journey, did a, a, a lot of good mission work. Uh, look at what they preached and what they taught in Acts chapter 14, verse 21 and 22. Can somebody read that, please? You read Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to the city uh, and, made, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Yes, so here we see that, you know, um, um, Paul and Barnabas, they realize that even as they are preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, they realize that, you know, um, they would face many difficult uh, hardships and persecutions and uh, tribulations. Look at what Paul preached when he was at, at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, and Acts chapter 20, verse 25. Can uh, two of our online students please read Acts chapter 19, verse 8? Someone else can read Acts chapter 20, verse 25. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Amen. So uh, when Paul was at Ephesus, we see that, you know, he spoke boldly in the synagogue. Okay, he was there almost for uh, three years. He spoke boldly in the synagogue for 
three months and then when persecution arise he moved on to the he took a hall called the the hall of tyrenius tyrenius and then he he preached and he taught it was like a bible school there and many of them who you know uh, maybe attended his Bible school, actually went around and started uh, churches around Ephesus. And that is how we have the seven churches uh, in Revelation uh, that is mentioned there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nina. John, you can also read Acts chapter 20, verse 25, please. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Yes, so Paul's testimony here, you know, um, uh, we see that, you know, he testifies to the elders from Ephesus indicating that he is emphasizing on preaching the kingdom of God in his uh, ministry, okay? Um, and uh, look at uh, when uh, Acts chapter 28, verses tw uh, 23, 31, and uh, yeah, Acts chapter 28, verses 23 and 31. Can somebody read that, please? You need to take the mic and read it. Yeah. <laughs> Acts chapter 28. Uh Verse 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in very large numbers to the place where he was staying. From the morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Verse 31, hmm. boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see that, you know, Paul is under house arrest. Uh, he is at Rome, so he is at Paul, uh, is at house arrest, which means that he has, you know, even though he's like imprisoned, he has the uh, access or opportunity for people to come and meet him. So even as he is, you know, um, uh, there in Rome, you know, look at him even if, as he is uh, in house arrest, he uh, must be really anticipating what is going to be the consequences of the judgment that Caesar is going to, you know, give uh, towards him. What is the verdict that Caesar is going to give towards him? But he's not just focusing on that and he's not doing any ministry. But here we see even in house arrest, what is people come to Paul and what does he use? How is he using his time? He's using it to preach the kingdom of God and the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ and he's preaching and teaching that with all confidence okay also look at how Paul writes about his workers and companions of his uh, kingdom uh, look at Colossians chapter 4 verse 11 can somebody read that please Colossians chapter 4 verse 11 and Jesus who is called justice these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, they have proved to be comfort to me. So Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and you know, when uh, he's, he always mentions about his co-workers, and so he's mentioning here about a person called Jesus, who was also called Justice, and he says, you know, uh, how does he uh, talk about them? He says they are his fellow workers for the kingdom of God. So even Paul like, thinking and living and doing everything in the framework of the kingdom of God. So it's also important for us to think, to live, and to know that we are part of the kingdom of God and not just part of this world. Okay, uh, Look at um, how John, uh, the beloved of Jesus, saw himself and others with him as companions suffering for the sake of the kingdom. Let's Can somebody read Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, please? I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes. So here we see that, you know, um, he says, I, John, and your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus 
Christ. Okay, so even John the Apostle is th uh, thinking in terms of the kingdom of God, and so important for us to think in terms of the kingdom of God. We'll stop here and we'll uh, come back after the break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.